Okay, so now in video two, we're going to start to do some of the math, both to be able to say, yes, it does seem like I have confounding here from all the third factors that I've thought about that could potentially be confounding my exposure outcome relationship, and also um, go through, okay, so what do I do now? How do I deal with this in my study? And we're going to go through a few ways to do that. So I'm going to start this video by <laughs> going through a fairly sil silly example of confounding because I think in some ways it's so silly that you guys should clearly be able to see, oh yeah, this is all due to this third factor. So say you were asking the research question, does regular newspaper reading cause cancer, right? So we have our exposure of reading the newspaper and we have our outcome of cancer. And the way you choose to do, deal with this or to address this question is with a case control study. So we have 100 people with cancer and 100 people without. And as you know from your knowledge of case control studies, we would ask their exposure history. We'd ask them, you know, how often do you read a newspaper? Okay, and so say we did this study or, you know, and we asked them, do you read the newspaper? Say we did this study and we calculated um, among our diseased or our cases, how many of our 100 read the newspaper, how many don't read the newspaper, and then among our people who don't have cancer, our controls, how many read the newspaper or don't read the newspaper. And remember from case control studies, we can only calculate odds ratios because we don't have measures of incidence. So we, we calculate our cross product AD over BC, and we end up with an odds ratio of 1.95. And so what this means is that individuals who read the newspaper have a 95% greater odds of cancer compared to non-readers. And you're like, yikes, that's almost like two times the risk of, um, of getting cancer from reading a newspaper. I should stop reading the newspaper. And then you start to settle down and you think, huh, that I wonder if this is actually a causal effect that I'm estimating or if there's some confounding going on. So the odds ratio of 1.95 would be accurate if newspaper readers and non-newspaper readers were identical in every attribute also associated with cancer. Again, so if the non-newspaper readers served as the counterfactual to the newspaper readers, if everything was the same among these groups but for reading the newspaper. However, you can start to think about there are lots of ways that newspaper readers are different from each other, and some of these ways might... Um, be also risk factors for cancer. So specifically, um, the problem is that people who read newspapers may be older than people who don't, and being old is a risk factor for cancer. So we may be seeing that reading a newspaper is um, associated with an elevated risk of cancer, but it's just that you have older people in the newspaper reading group. Age may be a confounder. And if age is a confounder of your newspaper reading um, cancer relationship, your odds ratio 1.95 is biased. It's wrong. If we took age into account, we'd end up probably end up with a different kind with a different um, odds ratio. And as you can imagine, you'd probably end up with one closer to the null, less of an association. But I think I'm giving away the punchline, so I'll stop talking on this slide. <laughs> okay, so we can set up our triangle to look at the to sort of sketch out the association. So we are interested in, is newspaper reading a risk factor for cancer? We think there's this other third, third variable, in this case, age. We think that age is correlated with reading a newspaper, so older people are more likely to read the newspaper. We know that age is a risk factor for cancer. As older, the older people get, the more likely they're going to end up with cancer. And we don't believe that age is on the causal pathway. So reading a newspaper makes you older which then leads to cancer. So you, as we start to sketch out our relationships, you start to say, hmm, you know, age, there might be something here with age. Um, and I just also want to point out at this point, like in all of these examples, we're thinking of single confounders. So we were like, ah, oh, I found the one thing that's my confounder. And that's not the way the world works, right? We could probably think of lots of different reasons. So maybe um, there's a different, you know, there's some association with socioeconomic status and reading a newspaper and then socioeconomic status is a risk factor for cancer or race or gender or, um, you know, I don't know if you have, if you, how your vision is, I don't know. <laughs> we can think of lots of ways that newspaper readers and non-newspaper readers may differ that we want to start to take into account. Okay, so First, we're going to go through our three criteria of a confounder. 
And, and we can actually, and as opposed to just saying, yeah, I think there's some association there, we can actually test that with our data. We can break the data we've collected in our case control study, our 100 cases and our 100 controls, um, into stratum and start to test, you know, are these things associated? So the first question we want to know, when we're trying to, excuse me, we're trying to figure out if newspaper reading, or if age is a confounder of our relationship, <coughs> is, is newspaper reading associated with age? Is it appropriate to have this line here? So say we, we broke out the data in our study and we stratified by age. We looked at people who are younger than 40 and people who are older than 40. And if when we do that, we can calculate an odds ratio, right? We can calculate a measure of association between any two factors. And we find out that there's an odds ratio of 0.11. So individuals less than 40 years old have an 89% lower odds of being a newspaper reader to comp to those compared to those over 40 years old. So there's clearly a very strong association between age and reading a newspaper when we stratify our sample by age older and younger than 40 years old. Number two, is age a risk factor for cancer? That's another criteria for something to be a confounder. So we can again break the data in our study up and look at the association between age and cancer. And we can find that when we calculate the odds ratio from a table like this, where we're looking at age and cancer, we get an odds ratio of 0.25. Our interpretation of this is that individuals less than 40 years old have a 75% lower odds of having cancer compared to individuals older than 40. Again, very strong association between age and cancer. If you're young, it's very protective against cancer. Question number three, criteria number three, is age on the causal pathway between newspaper reading and cancer? That is, does age cause newspaper reading? <laughs> oh no, actually. Again, typo. Does newspaper reading cause you to be a certain age? <laughs> and the answer is no, right? That would just be silly if reading a newspaper could change your age. Okay, so we've now tested and agreed upon our three causal criteria. We can start to really think, gosh, I really think age is confounding my situation here and I should explore this more in depth. So using our knowledge and confirming through our data, age confounds the relationship between newspaper reading and cancer. Age is associated with newspaper reading, it's a risk factor for cancer, and it's not on the causal pathway. We have met our three criteria for a confounder, at least in theory. So what do we do? Now you're wondering, I have this third factor that I believe is completely, or to some extent, distorting the relationship between my exposure and my outcome of interest. I need to deal with it. So there are six ways that we can deal with confounding. Three of these ways are at the design stage when we first design our study, and three of these are at the analysis stage after we've collected data and we need to deal with it. Um, so it's nice to know that there are things that you can do at, at multiple times in the course of your study to deal with confounding. And as I mentioned earlier, you may have a lot of different confounding variables, and you believe that some are stronger confounders than others. You know, in this case, we believe age is like a huge problem and we're gonna to need to deal with it. So you may do something, let's say at the design stage to really ensure that you're dealing with confounding by age. And then there may be sort of, you believe less strong confounders later on that you want to deal with it in, with an, in another way. Um, and the way you deal with confounding is really, you know, what's sort of feasible within your study, what data have you collected, what type of population are you dealing with, all those types of things. So I'm gonna go through all six of these. At the design stage, um, we can randomize exposures. We can restrict our study sample to one level of the um, confounder, or we can match people. And we've talked about matching earlier in the semester when we talked about case control studies, we'll talk about it again. At the analysis stage, and I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm gonna go through all these in a little more depth. We can standardize. Remember way, way back in the beginning, we talked about standardizing because the populations um, had different you know, if we were comparing two different populations that it had a different age distribution, we standardized. We can use statistical modeling or we can stratify. So let's start to walk through these in more detail. So what do we mean by randomization? And next week we're gonna talk about randomized control trials so you'll get a much better sense of randomization. But randomization is the process of assigning exposures to people and doing so randomly. 
right? So instead of like in our observational studies, our cohort and case control studies where people for through whatever process are, you know, selected into their exposure, this is different. This is in a study where we would say you have to be exposed to this and you are not, you know, someone else is not exposed to this. And so what happens is that because people aren't selecting their exposures, you're sort of breaking the relationship between behaviors that cluster together or exposures that cluster together and your exposure of interest. So randomization balances potential confounders across exposure groups with when you have large enough sample sizes, right? So if you believe that age is a confounder of your relationships, I think I have this here. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll go through that in more detail. Um, so if you believe that age is a confounder of your relationship between newspaper reading and having cancer, you can randomize people to read the newspaper, right? You can say, you're going to be a newspaper reader. You're not. And when you do that enough times and you randomly assign enough people to either group, naturally by sort of the laws of big numbers, your age distributions are going to be balanced across your two groups because you've broken the relationship between newspaper reading and age. Um, so to do this, no, both the cool thing about randomization is that both known and unknown confounders are addressed. You may do it because you're concerned about age and you want to make sure that age is balanced across your exposure groups. But the other great thing is that there may be potentially confounding factors that you're not even aware of that are also balanced across exposed and unexposed groups with randomization. The problem is, even though randomization and randomized control trials seem like this, you know, perfect solution to everything, the problem is they're often not feasible. We're going to talk a lot in, in a lot more depth next week about why randomization may not be feasible. It may be unethical to randomize someone to something. Um, people may, you know, your exposure may be so horrible that no one would ever sign up for your study if they could potentially be randomized to, to be exposed to something like that, things, situations like that. Not always feasible to randomize. Okay, so let's come back to our example of um, our relationship between newspaper reading and cancer. If we were to deal, oops, sorry, if we were to deal with randomization in this case, as I said before, we would be randomizing people to reading the newspaper or not. And that would balance out age across your groups. You'd end up with enough people in your study to have the same distribution of ages in your exposed group and your unexposed group. And once you've balanced that third factor across your unexposed group and exposed group, they are counterfactuals. You don't have to worry about confounding by that third factor. Restriction is another option. So, so you don't have to worry that you have really young people in your um, unexposed group and really old people in your exposed group. You can restrict and say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to recruit old people. Not that over 40 is that old because I'm approaching it. Um, but I'm just going to recruit old people into my study. And then I don't have to worry about this lack of balance. So restriction is limiting your study sample to a narrow range of your confounder. And then there's just not variation um, in your exposed and your unexposed group of the level of that confounder. The problem is that this is difficult to do for several third factors, for several potential confounders. So for age, you know, if age is your biggest concern, that's easy. You can say, you know what, I'm just going to look at newspaper readers and non-newspaper readers among people over 40. And then I've, to some extent, dealt with age. But what happens if you think that race is a confounder and gender and SES and all these other things? You can't begin restricting to the point where you say, I'm only going to take over 40 black men who are high SES, um, et cetera, et cetera, because it's going to have a really hard time recruiting people into your study. Um, and the other problem with restriction is that once you have a restricted study sample, you can't examine your third factor if your exposure is of interest. So say you actually, once you do your initial study of newspaper reading and cancer, you say, you know, maybe I just want to look, maybe I think the relationship is different among younger people and older people. And maybe for younger people, it's actually true that newspaper reading causes cancer. Well, once you've restricted and you've never included young people in your study, you can't look at that group. Okay, so we've talked about, in the case of our newspaper reading and cancer example, what restriction would mean. It means um, taking people into your study at just one level or one stratum of your confounder, and then you don't have to worry about unbalanced, non-balance of that confounder across your exposed and unexposed group. Matching, another thing you can do when you start out your study, when you're planning your study. 
to deal with confounding. So in matching, study participants are selecting, selected so that potential confounders are equally distributed in their exposed, unexposed, or case and control groups. So it's the idea that if you believe race is a confounder, you are going to, and you have a case, let's say in a case control study who's black, you want to find a black person, probably specifically a black male or a black female or something else, to match in your control group. And once you have confirmed that you know, you have the same racial distribution in your cases and your controls because you've purposely done that, then you've forced those third factors to be balanced across your exposed and unexposed groups. Um, there are a lot of different ways we can do matching. Um, we can do a one-on-one -on -one or individual matching. So like you need a black male who's over 40 and you, in, and you have that in your cases and then you go find that in your controls. Or you could do frequency matching where you say, okay, my cases, among all my cases, they're 20% black, they're 60% male, et cetera, et cetera. And you match the frequency of those third factors in your control group. So it's not individually that each person has a match, but across the two groups you've matched in the distribution of your confounders. Um, I keep talking about it in the context of a case control study because it's much more common in a case control study to do this kind of matching. And similar to restriction, once you've matched people on these factors, you can't then go back and tease apart and look at the influence of those matched variables on your outcome. You can't say anything in regards to race or to gender or whatever you've matched on because you've forced your sample to be equally distributed um, across those third factors. So in the case of our situation with newspaper reading and cancer, what we might want to do to deal with um, confounding by age is match. So we may have a cancer patient, again, who's, who is over 40, and then we try to find a control person who is also over 40. And then in our cases and our control groups, our exposure, um, our distribution of third factors is, ma is, um, is matched across those two groups. Something can't be con a confounder anymore if it's balanced, if it's the same distribution in our exposed and our unexposed or our cases or control group. Okay, so we've now talked about three ways in the design phase of our study that we can deal with confounding. Randomization, restriction, matching. Now there, we're going to talk about the three things that we can do after you've already done your study when hopefully, ideally, you've measured something about your third factors, you knew something about your participants' age or race or gender. And I, I bring up these confounding factors because they're almost always confounders. <laughs> age, race, gender. Um, almost always want to deal with them in some way. Um, anyway, so we're going to move on to talking about our three things that we can do after the fact, after you've already collected all your data and you realize, oh, I need to deal with confounding. So the first one of these things that we do once we already have our data and our study is completed is standardization. And as I mentioned earlier, you guys have seen standardization before when we were talking about mortality. And we were talking about the fact that you can't, um, it's difficult to compare populations that have different age distributions, whether it's like in the same geographic area over time or in two different states or two different countries. Um, if, if, so you can't, it's difficult to compare those two places when the distributions of socio, socio-demographic factors are different across those two places because you don't know if it's something exactly about that place that's leading to mortality or it's just the fact that that place, let's say, has a different age distribution. So much younger people live there, much older people live there, and that's what's driving the mortality rates. And it's not actually, doesn't actually say anything about health care resources in that population or, or things like that. Then, I mean, it's important to realize the non-standardized relative risks, and this is true for confounding in general, the non-adjusted or dealt with measures of association they may be true, they may be, they are what you observe in the real world. But if we want to get to a point where we're saying, does X cause Y, then we need to deal with all these confounders. So there's nothing wrong per se with looking at two sets of mortality rates across regions that have different distributions of sociodemographic characteristics. That's the truth. That's okay if all you're going to do is describe them, but if you want to then say something more about did, is there the healthcare resources in this place contributing to different mortality, you need to take into account and balance all those other confounders and sort of get them out of the way. 
So back to standardization. Um, as we talked about, standardization computes um, comparable rates of, in the case we've talked about mortality, by using a standard population. So what you do most generally is you take a standard population, often the population of the U.S. Then you apply the specific rates from your geographic area to the distribution, the standard population that has a set distribution. And then you can compare the two places because you've standardized them, you've equalized them from a standard single population. There's no more issue about differing, um, differing distributions of sociodemographic characteristics. Um, and so, so in the case of our mortality, we believe that age confounded our association between geographic place and mortality. And to account for age, we used a standard population, as I just said. And we used the age-specific rates. You don't, I told you guys you didn't need to know these details, and now I'm getting into them, so I'm going to back off. Bottom line, um, we can sort of apply our location-specific rates to a standard population, and then we don't have to worry about demographic differences. The problem with standardization is that it's not easy to standardize across multiple confounders. And as you'll see, this is coming up a bunch of different times. But in our studies, we have lots of variables that potentially confound our measures of association. And a lot of these methods of dealing with confoundings only deal with one confounder at a time. So it makes it very difficult when you have a laundry list of third factors that you want to deal with. OK, so if we wanted to deal with our um, newspaper reading and cancer situation and sort of deal with confounding by age, what we could do is, let me think about this. So we could take the age-specific cancer rates in our newspaper readers, the age-specific cancer rates in our non-newspaper readers, and apply them to a single standard population. And you'd end up with an adjusted or a standardized rate of newspaper reading no, rate of cancer, I apologize, among our newspaper readers and our non-newspaper readers, and you can compare those two. Okay, a lot of details. I'm not asking you guys. I told you I'm not asking you to know the details of standardization, but know that it's a way to deal with confounding after the fact, after you've already collected your data. Okay, we're down to number five. This class is always just seems a little long because it's this laundry list of, <laughs> of uh, methods, so stick with me. Okay. So statistical modeling, you guys, um, I don't think many of you in our MPH program on the tracks you're on are going to take multivariate statistics, but this is the whole idea of multivariate statistics. So if you love biostats, and that's awesome, and you want to move into multivariate statistics, then you're going to learn to start to deal, you're going to learn how to start to deal with confounding through your statistical modeling. Um, so statistical modeling uses regression estimates to adjust for one or more confounding factors. And what it's doing is it estimates the relationship between your exposure and your outcome when confounders are fixed at a certain level. And usually that level is sort of the, um, the average within your um, population. Um, it's statistical modeling using multivariate regression is the most flexible and commonly used method to deal with confounding. Um, You'll often, you know, as you guys are reading more papers and you'll say, you know, these models were adjusted for all these things, that's because of confounding. They basically put, put the code in and um, say, can you deal with age? And the computer does it <laughs> and your regression equations do it. What happens though is that often, in, or not often, I shouldn't say that, occasionally you need to be wary when you're doing multivariate regression that you're not sort of making up data. So Say you had a situation where your exposed group was, just because of what happened, was completely women, and then your unexposed group was completely men, right? So you did not have any, you, your situation was completely confounded by age. You, it would be, you can't even say what a male exposed or a female unexposed would look like because you don't have anyone in your data set who looks like that. The problem is, say then you, you collect these data and you don't realize that you have no, you know, you have sort of 100% overlap of your exposure and gender. You can't separate out the two, but your computer program doesn't know that. So you may be able to put in gender and say, can you adjust for this and give me an adjusted relationship between my exposure and my outcome? 
And the computer program may very well spit back an adjusted relationship, but it's coming from false data because you had no um, variation in gender in your exposed and your unexposed group. There's nothing to be drawing these results from. So just this is something to be aware of. And, and a good statistician will always sort of look at their preliminary data and say, okay, this will work. We can actually balance gender across our two groups because we've got some variation and we know something about men who were exposed or women who are unexposed. Okay, the final way to deal with confounding, and this is actually the really important one for this, um, this lecture on confounding, is stratification. And what we do when we stratify is that we calculate the relationship between our exposure and our outcome at each level of our third factor. And so once we, so in, the, in this case, and we're gonna do this in a second, we can look at the, the, what's the relationship between newspaper reading and cancer for people under 40, and what's the relationship between newspaper reading and cancer for people over 40. We have divided by strata of our third factor, and we looked at the association between our exposure and our outcome of interest within each strata. And then what you can do is you can report stratum specific associations. So you can say, this is my association for people under 40, this is my association for people over 40, or you can actually pool those estimates. And we're not gonna do that in this course, but that's something, um, a mantle Hansel odds ratio, if you ever come across that, is a way of pooling those strata specific estimates. Um, as with most things, <laughs> most methods, it's difficult to do across multiple third factors, right? Because if you stratify by age and then gender and then race, you're getting into a lot of different strata, right? And you're calculating a lot of associations and, and you start, it becomes very difficult to get sort of a picture of the relationships. But it's a very good thing to do um, for a single confounder. So let's go through our example again. We want to know, <laughs> is there association between newspaper reading and cancer? We believe it's confounded by age. If we're going to deal with this through stratification, we're going to look at our relationship between newspaper reading, newspaper reading and cancer among our young people and among our old people, and then make some decisions. So let's go through this again. So without regard to age, without accounting for differences in age between our readers and our non-readers, we ended up with an odds ratio of 1.95. We saw this already. So what we want to do now to deal with confounding by age is stratify by age. And this was arbitrary, right, that we chose under 40 and over 40. It's sort of the way we've been looking at this. Um, you know, again, we could have we could have stratified by 10-year increments. We could have said what's up with people 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and calculated measures of association within each one of those strata as long as we have enough people within in our study in those strata. Okay, so we stratify by age. We have our younger group and our older group. We then cal very simply calculate our odds ratios again. Cross products AD over BC. Miraculously, among our younger than 40 group, our odds ratio is one. It's the null. If this is saying among people under 40, there is no association between reading the newspaper, and having cancer. We then look among, among the group over 40, calculate our odds ratio, again, an odds ratio of one. Isn't this incredible? So before we stratified, we ended up with an odds ratio of 1.95. Now we're looking separately at our people under 40 and our people over 40, and the odds ratio becomes one. It becomes null. There is no association within each of, either of these groups. We have successfully dealt with confounding by stratifying. So what happened here? So the odds ratios in each of our strata are equal to each other. In this case, they both equaled one, the null, but that doesn't have to be the case. You've successfully dealt with confounding if you look within your strata and the measures of association are equal to each other. And they're different than your crude or your original or your unadjusted, whatever you want to call it, odds ratio of 1.95. This means that we have successfully accounted for age and we've been able to obtain an unbiased estimate. So our unbiased, our unconfounded estimate of association is one. That was true in our younger group and in our older group. Our odds ratio of 1.95 was confounded by age. And the cool thing about stratification is that the same method, 
both identifies confounding, says check, yes, I had confounding, and it's a way to address confounding. So if you stratify and you end up with the same measure of association across your strata, and that measure of association is sufficiently different than your overall measure of association, you can say, yes, I had confounding. This third factor that I've now stratified on was confounding my relationship. And at the same time, simultaneously, you've dealt with confounding because your stratum specific estimates are unconfounded. Those are the truer. Now, I'm not going to say it's perfectly true because you could have a lot of confounding by a lot of other junk going on too. But for the case of your confounder, those are your truer measures of association. This is really important, guys, this idea of stratification, that it both confirms confounding and that you have dealt with it. And I'm just going to say it one more time. If you stratify and you find that your measures of association are the same across your strata, strata and they're different than the crude, then you have confirmed you have confounding and your stratum-specific estimates are your unconfounded estimates. Okay, so what did we learn from this whole saga of reading the newspaper in cancer? We determined that being older is associated with cancer. Older people are more likely to read the newspaper. Age is not on the causal pathway between newspaper reading and cancer. Check, check, check. We've met our criteria for confounder. We can move forward starting to say, I think I need to deal with age. The way we dealt with it was we stratified by age category, our under 40 and our over 40, and we observed the ORs within each stratum and they were equal to each other, and they were different than the overall, and we therefore confirmed that confounding by age was present. We now can report our age-specific associations, which in this case happen to both be one, and that's the unconfounded relationship. That's the true, we think, getting closer to a causal relationship because we have successfully dealt with age. Okay, so what's the overall message of confounding? The issue of confounding is at the heart of epi because we almost always deal with observational data. It's awesome if we can randomize and assign people to exposure, but a lot of times that's not the way the world works. Going way back when I told you guys I'm writing this grant to look at childhood trauma, right? We would never randomize and have someone experience childhood trauma versus not. So we need to use observational data in all of its messiness to try to start to see, to understand the causal effects of a lot of our exposures of interest. A confounder is something that you are not primarily interested in. It, it masks or it confuses your exposure disease relationship of interest. We want to get rid of confounding. We want to get rid of the association of age because we felt like it was mucking up our results. Um, and confounding can be evaluated by criteria, by our rule of thumb. And what I mean by rule of thumb is like, is your stratum specific estimate sufficiently different than our crude estimate? And that's generally a difference of 10% or more don't need to worry about that. Um, and thinking, this is the bottom line, guys. When you are studying a topic, you want to immerse yourself in the literature around that topic and understand what are the potential confounders? What are these third factors that go along with my exposure of interest that are going to muck up my, my, my relationships? And so I either need to deal with them at the design stage in my study, or I need to measure them and deal with them in the analysis stage of my study. All right. Thanks, guys.